Hey guys, uh, so real quick we're just going to do this and then knock this out of the park so that we can get right on with the tutorial. So number one, um, I'm still figuring out where the camera is. Uh, I changed up my camera mount and got a much more reliable one and as a result of that it physically moved where the camera was. Uh, those of you who know how I record, it's right in front of me so that my hands are right where they need to be and as a result of that, unfortunately, we've ended up in a situation where I put my hands where the camera used to focus instead of where it currently is focusing in a lot of shots. That muscle memory, I keep pulling my hands away and to the right instead of leaving them directly in front of me. So I do apologize about that, but we are going to learn and move forward from that. I've wanted to change up the way that I'm doing editing on these videos and how my tutorials come across. I will plan to continue to do in the future when I have more time full length tutorials, but for now we're going to cut away from full length tutorials and we're going to do what I call hyper focusing. And what that's going to basically boil out to is we are going to hyper focus on the things that are important to this miniature and the things that I feel need to be covered. So if we're trying to teach a lesson in this week's video or next week's video or whenever, then we'll hyper focus on whatever that lesson is and then paint the whole model. So I really enjoy tutorials that are like this, but normally in those types of tutorials, they just show you the thing and they don't show you the whole model finished. Very few channels do that. And to me, that's not very satisfying. So I really want to push forward and be one of those channels that shows you the finished product. Besides, if you look at my pile of shame in either one of these corners, you'll know that I have plenty of stuff that'll keep us busy for a while. And I've got plenty of stuff over there that'll keep us busy that's off screen that you guys can't even see, as well as a few big projects I'm in the middle of that I can't wait to share with you. But enough of my rambling, let's move on and hopefully you guys will like this new style of editing. I do apologize for this being a bit of a long-winded intro, but let's move on and let's talk about how I painted a Duragar. Hey guys, welcome back. In today's video we're going to be talking about how to paint a dwarf. Uh, in this case I start out by cleaning the model because he's been sitting around on the shelf for a while. So you'll see me reach in with a pair of tweezers a couple times during the video and that's just me trying to get them all cleaned up. Next we're going to start out with three different shades of brown that you want to go ahead and pre-prepare if you're not using contrast paints like myself. In my case I'll be using a Gunta Fur and uh, Flayer Flesh as my darker tones and Skeleton Horde as a brighter, more wood tone, more natural leather color. You'll see be using that in the gauntlets and the boots and his backpack more than anywhere else. We're planning to go for a bit of a Xenophil highlight in today's video going from his axe side to his shield side coming from that upper shoulder head region all the way down into the deeper shadows being in between that shield arm and his rib cage. So I ended up using about three tones worth of the Gunther 4 and then end up using about two tones worth of the Slayer Flesh color. And what that does is it basically allows there to be a bit of warmth, a bit of red in the light side that is exposed to our light source and allows the other recesses to remain super dark. And this just adds a bit of color in places where your eye wouldn't normally detect it, 
but it is there and it adds a certain pop to everything. I ended up down the road adding a bit of line work into his axe handle to give it a bit more definition. Now I skipped this on the back side of the shield because I knew it was in such recessed shadow there was no point in trying to get in there and add detail to something that you would never see. I ended up going from a dryad bark all the way to XV88 on the highlights to darkness on the axe handle and uh, in the close up later on you can get a real good look at that and it, it really does look like wood grain even in such a small scale. In my D&D world, the dwarves from this specific tribe tend to have very dark red beards, and I knew I needed something to contrast or complement it well, and I knew I wanted to bring greens into this paint job at some point, as I don't use greens often enough. I ended up comparing through the bottom of the bottle because of my red-green color blindness. This allows me to see a more true color, as opposed to just going purely based on what the bottles are labeled. So I end up settling with Wog Flesh and Death World Forest. Now our Death World Forest is just our first layer of highlights. I end up adding a bit of moot green into that Death World Forest, and that ends up getting us our final highlight, at least for the armor. For his backpack, I got a little bit more creative with the level of how many layers I'm adding, because this is where our first introduction into the contrast between the light side of the model and the dark side of the model really has to come into play because it covers such a wide area of the model as well as where the light and the shadow falls on the miniature. I'm actually able to get away with just adding in some black and brown washes onto one shoulder pad to really darken up the colors enough to get that contrast across. but. In the case of things like the beard and the bedroll, I have to be a little bit more creative, and you'll see what I mean by that very soon. So once again, silly me, uh, I end up holding the model off camera. I need to really figure this out so that I can stop making these mistakes. I know some of you are probably quite tired of it. Uh, but to explain what's going on here, because I know this camera angle is going to be jank to look at. I basically started out with log flesh across the entire thing and then I went into two directions with that. Number one, I went in warp stone glow with a stippling motion across anywhere where the light was going to touch the bedroll. And then I went in with a Lauren forest and did the same thing but stippled everywhere where the shadows were going to be. I then slowly added a little bit of moot green into both of these colors to create a highlight from that point and then used moot green directly for extreme highlights only. I then took Incubi Darkness and I painted both of the sleeves with that. I end up almost completely going black all over on the sleeve next to the shield as I figured it would be cast in so much shadow that you really wouldn't be able to make out very much of the color. On the other sleeve, however, I end up using Altic Blue and I end up highlighting up in a glaze and I used about three layers to get the full opacity of the Altic Blue where I needed it to, where it would be most exposed to the light. I wanted to do this because I needed to add a third color in here that I thought would do a good job at just adding a bit of diversity in the color. I know with the skin tones I'm planning to use very cool skin tones and I wanted a cool blue to go with those cool skin tones. When it came time to do the beard I ended up not really having to do anything too magical. I ended up coating the entire thing with corn red and I ended up using another red but in the end it all came out about corn red anyway. So just go ahead and if you're following along at home coat the entire beard in corn red. This is a nice deep red, which is great for your shadows. 
and then I end up slowly introducing Scarlet from Model Color Vallejo into that corn red on my wet palette. Now you don't have to have a wet palette, it just helps a little bit. And we end up slowly adding that red in and I make it more and more scarlet, more and more vibrant toward the side where the light is coming from. And then I reinforce the shadows by adding in a Nalm Oil shade in between the braids and in between some of the facial structure on the shadow side. So where the hair comes in close to the face before it flows back out again into those braids. I just add a little bit of Nalm Oil in there to help knock down all those colors and darken everything. Now there ends up being a pretty dramatic jump cut here and what I did is I went ahead and I put in all the metals. I ended up using Screaming Bell on the axe head which is the coppery tone and I end up using Balthazar Gold as our highlight color for that. And then I used Balthazar Gold as well as Retributor Armor Gold and I built those colors up on the shield to do a darker more aged gold look on those little bands that go around what I've now painted to look like rope which I've done with Xandri Dust hit that with a Agrax Earthshade wash and then I went ahead and with all of our silvers I used gunmetal from metal color and I used the silver from metal color and what that does is because they're an alcohol based pigment paint I'm able to blend those so smoothly together between the darks and the lights and then I went ahead and I hit all the gemstones with that so that I could cover it with a green glaze which is my second favorite way of doing gemstones. It's a bit of a cheater way and we'll do a more in-depth tutorial talking about that in the future as I've got a few projects that have some decent sized gemstones which will make a really great video for that which is why I didn't bother to record it for this video. Also I needed a time saver because if you haven't noticed we're almost at our mark for an average video and we're only about a third of the way, maybe two thirds of the way done. I end up using a mixture of Xandri dust and a tiny bit of the XV88 that was already on my wet palette and I end up creating this nice deep brown color which I then end up using a bit more Xandri dust as a highlight but for the most part we pretty much left it this color and I just used selective washing meaning I picked very specific spots to apply Agrax or Shade Wash to so not only do I end up covering all of the horns, but then I go back in with a second coat and cover parts of it. So that allows it to give more natural shadows so that it reinforces that light to dark ratio that we're trying to do from, again, his right hand to his left hand. Now again, I know, I know, I know, really bad camera work, but I'm actually doing a jade bore insignia on the shield. And so the way that I do this, and it's one of my favorite ways of doing jade, and I'll make a more in-depth video about it hopefully very soon, but I use Incubi Darkness as our base tone. And then I go in and I very lightly use a Warp Stone Glow to start building up those colors. And then I use Moot Green as our final highlight. And I do this in very selective places using a glaze. In my case here with the bore, you can see me applying a glaze to the face, the arch of the back and each of the legs and I'm staying away from what would be the recesses if this was a three-dimensional bore. Here is one of the last major steps. I'm going in and I'm cleaning up the skin tone using glazes and I'm using a mixture of scavenge blight dinge and dawnstone and I'm using scavenge blight dinge as our highest color in the recesses and dawnstone as our highest highlight. However, I will not be applying Dawnstone to anywhere in the shadows, mostly meaning the left side of his face and his left arm. We end up getting this super stark shadow right across the bridge of the nose, which I then reinforce later on the rest of the model by adding more washes of Agrax Earthshade and Nalm Oil in places to really darken down the color. I mostly stick to using the Agrax Earthshade in places such as metal tones and leathers and the Nalm Oil on pretty much everything else. And just real quick here you can see all of our hard work at play. I'm going to go ahead and base this the same way that I base all of my miniatures except one exception. I'm not a big fan of this base but I also need the base to match. If this was a plastic miniature I could just clip the base off. Unfortunately, it's a pewter miniature, and that can cause some complications for removing bases. Trust me, I would know. I've done it quite a few times, and it's not a fun experience. 
So, I've come up with a solution, and I flip the Citadel base upside down, and I glue it inside the rim, and then I fill it in with texture paint. I feel like this does a really good job of helping to hide these, not necessarily ugly, but less desirable base designs on some of these older pewter miniatures. Bloor Silver Axe. One of the few Duragar who will venture about on the surface, and unfortunately for most adventurers who assume he's an easy target being a solo individual. His bag of tricks, well, they would put any good rogue to shame, but more often than not this gentleman can be found working with various ne'er-do-wells. Not necessarily for the coin, but for the connections that he makes along the way. He's always working on something in the background, and he's oftentimes a bigger part of the picture than you would anticipate. Thank you guys so much for all the love and support you've shown this channel. I am blown away by just how much you guys have really shown your support for me and, and doing these tutorials. I know I said I wanted to make things shorter, and this video was not short by any means, but it is something that I'm working on, and I do want to make a bit more hyper-focused tutorials in the future. If you could share this video around, it would really mean the world to me. It's a great way to help this channel grow, and it doesn't cost you anything. However, if you would like to support this channel in any financial standard of any type, I will be putting a link tree in the description, and that is a great way where you can find places where you can donate through various means, or even help buy models to sponsor episodes. As always, I hope your display case is always overfilled and your pile of shame never runs empty. Until next time, guys.